Um, I'm very honored and I'm very pleased to be here on the occasion of the opening of the Korea EU Institute which I think will be a big step forward in understanding Korean and Northeast Asian politics with all the ramifications around. And it will also be a very good place upgraded in the connection EU-Korea here in Berlin for discussions, for research and for um, political meetings alongside the academic work. So ladies and gentlemen, um, dear students, uh, perhaps the COVID-19 subject will change the world profoundly and more deeply than we expected. The voice of science has clearly become more important and the relationship between science and the governments who have to work with their advice and their input has changed a little bit how they work. The unpredictable anyway has returned to the agendas of world politics. And behind it looms the next huge challenge, and this is climate change. If governments worldwide do not act soon and decisively to stem climate change, we may not recognize our planet in 10 years' time any longer as we know it. The president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, already strongly welcomed the Korean Green Deal when she commented on the EU Korea summit, which was held in June, though a virtual summit uh, this year. Given these two challenges, which will need so much more of our energies, it is all the more urgent to make progress on the situation of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea, in the Economist's democracy rating at a laudable place, 23 out of 168 states, whereas North Korea occupies the last place, remains a top performer in high-tech developments and science industry, and it has a very lively and popular culture. The government of the Republic of Korea now enjoys a strong majority. It has embarked on a new dialogue process with the North in 2017. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a bumpy road. The steering wheel shifted to Washington and Pyongyang under conditions of high volatility and unpredictability. No results on the nuclear issue were achieved and the Korean Peninsula is still far from a peace treaty. However, the summit between President Trump and uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un has also been a market sign of raised interest and perhaps of uh, a new phase in terms of the level of contacts. In other words, it is hard to think that could be rolled back. Last month, the North showcased a new larger intercontinental ballistic missile in a triumphant military parade. So it remains to be seen what is behind and how they will explain. In any case, Seoul is needed, it seems to me, more than ever to rebalance to bring in its experience and to lead a consultation process with its neighbors and the large powers. As South Korean Foreign Minister Kang kyung wa said last week to lawmakers, she believed President-elect Biden would try to capitalize on the momentum Trump built in his summits with Kim Jong-un to continue nuclear talks. She said, the achievements of the past three years, the agreements and stated statements were between the heads of state in North, South Korea and the US. I don't think they will go back to square one. That will raise the question during this meeting and the following after uh, this day about the essential points of the Panmunjom Declaration of April 2018 where both the leaders met and they planted a tree. Looking back at 2017, let us remind Kim Jong-un's military provocations, Donald Trump's offensive rhetoric and military maneuvers, China's tough position over the deployment of the THAAD missile system in South Korea, and last but not least, domestic polarization in South Korea made it not easy for President Moon Jae-in to advance the matters. 
Then came 2018. The already mentioned Panmunjom Declaration, both sides reaffirmed their non-aggression commitments. They said they wanted to pursue a nuclear-free Korean Peninsula, talks between them, the US and China, for an end to the war and a lasting peace regime. I'm now very happy to give the floor to Professor Yu, the former foreign minister. He will speak first on the situation of the South, and then Professor Starks is so kind to comment from a German and European perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Yoon. Thank you very much. Um, it's my great pleasure to participate uh, in this very meaningful uh, conference. And I'm also glad to meet you, I mean, Ambassador Novet Bas uh, and uh, Professor uh, Mikhail Oshtak. Uh, to exchange our views with uh, the audience. And uh, thank you for inviting me uh, I mean, uh, to this uh, very important uh, conference. And my thanks, especially, I mean, go to the two uh, sponsoring organizations of this conference, Free University of Berlin and KDI School. And I'd like to congratulate uh, on inauguration conference for opening uh, the Korea Economic Center. And I, uh, I'd like to commend uh, Professor Eun Jung Lee for her devotion and contribution. Uh, as we know, I mean, she is very energetic person and uh, she devoted her energy and passion uh, to the development of mutual relationship between Germany and uh, Korea. And, uh, I mean, uh, she also, I mean, uh, contributed deepening uh, bilateral understanding through educating young generation uh, students and her research and her public service. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to also take this opportunity to express my respect and uh, sincere gratitude uh, to uh, Chancellor Gerard Schroeder and Mrs. Uh, Schroeder, they have been doing an excellent uh, and important uh, job in strengthening Korea-German relationship quietly and effectively in the recent few years. I know they meet uh, leaders uh, I mean, in various fields of the Korean society and deepen uh, and enlighten the understanding of Germany and Europe. Um, if uh, somebody asks me, uh, what is the characteristics of the current period uh, in international history, I would describe this period as the era of entering into uh, international uh, leadership vacuum. Uh, the rising power China uh, is not ready uh, to, to take the role of international leader. That country has been, I mean, uh, occupied, uh, preoccupied with uh, their uh, concern about their uh, country's national interest rather than, uh, I mean, trying to contribute uh, to the provision of international or public goods. Uh, the established uh, power, the United States, the will and capability of the United States to exercise a leadership are being shaken as we have all noticed in recent years, especially in the last four years. As a result, uh, there is an international leadership vacuum and lack of provision of international public goods, and the liberal and rule-based international order uh, seem to be receding. And I think uh, the coalition and common efforts among the next tier or the middle powers are essential. And Korea and Europe share the common goals to maintain to liberal and the rule-based order in international relations. 
And this is why, you know, Eurasian of the Korea Europe Center is so meaningful and important because it will uh, help uh, to deepen uh, the uh, cooperative relationship between Korea and Europe in the future. I hope this institute will be able to provide uh, both Korea and Europe with an important platform for academicians as well as uh, practitioners uh, for future uh, mutual cooperation. Let me briefly uh, overview the current South Korean uh, domestic situation. Uh, as we all know, the year 2020 was also a very difficult year for the South Koreans as people in many other parts of the world. It's, of course, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, I think the uh, Korean government, the Korean government uh, has been doing relatively well in dealing with this uh, pandemic. Uh, but uh, economic crisis uh, caused by this pandemic is serious, even in this country, uh, especially uh, our government and many uh, observers are worried about worsening economic situation of, of the uh, workers uh, who are working in small and medium-sized enterprises and uh, <clears throat> unemployed people or uh, those uh, I mean, uh, special workers uh, working for quick delivery services, et cetera, et cetera. So how to help them to survive remains uh, one of the uh, most urgent agenda for the Korean government. Uh, the IMF I mean, expected that uh, Korea's economic growth rate uh, this year would be minus 1.9%. Uh, I mean, relatively speaking, I mean, it's uh, better than and the situation in other, some other countries, but still this is hurting uh, I mean, those uh, I mean, people who are I mean, in a difficult uh, I mean, situation because of the uh, layoffs or uh, I mean, reduction of job opportunities and even young generation uh, uh, are suffering I mean, because of that. In terms of uh, Korean politics, we finished the National Assembly election on April uh, 15th in the middle of pandemic crisis. Uh, the result was a landslide victory for the ruling party, the Liberal Democratic Party. Uh, it could acquire 163 seats out of 300 seats and the Conservative Party, uh, United Future Party, got uh, 84 assists. Uh, many uh, specialists of the Korean uh, election says that the ruling party benefited from uh, Korean government's uh, handling, uh, relatively, I mean, uh, efficient handling of uh, I mean, uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Next April, I mean, uh, we have uh, by-election selecting mayors in uh, Seoul and Busan. And this political event is, re is uh, regarded as very important because the result of this uh, uh, election uh, will indicate the trend of a public opinion in terms of the next uh, presidential election in March 2022. So uh, many people uh, are interested in, in watching uh, what will happen in this uh, I mean, uh, mayoral election in Seoul and Busan next uh, April. <coughs> Regarding the inter-Korean relations, uh, let me uh, briefly comment this way. I mean, since the failure of the negotiation on denuclearization in Hanoi, Vietnam, 
in February 2019, inter-Korean relations uh, has become sour. And also there were I mean, some unfortunate uh, incidents like explosion of a liaison office building in Panmunjom and the killing of a South Korean official in the West Sea uh, <coughs> by the North Korean uh, soldiers. And I think this chilly atmosphere between two Koreas will continue for the time being. This, uh, despite uh, South Korean government's uh, efforts to improve the inter-Korean uh, relations. Another important topic is how South Koreans uh, perceive the election of Joe Biden as uh, the next uh, US president and what consequences for the uh, Korean Peninsula and uh, East Asia uh, will be. Uh, I think um, most Koreans, in my personal view, seem to be relieved uh, to see the election results in the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, that's mainly because uh, President Trump's uh, unique view on uh, foreign, U.S. foreign policy and his uh, view on the importance of uh, alliance. Uh, actually, as we know, I mean, he uh, didn't put uh, much value uh, on uh, alliance relationship uh, between the United States and uh, other parties in, the United, in, in, in Europe as well as in uh, East Asia. So he sometimes took a kind of unilateral actions and uh, President Trump uh, frequently mentioned that he wanted to withdraw uh, US troops uh, someday in the future. Of course, I think uh, both government can discuss uh, the possibility of reducing the size of US troop uh, stationing in, in, uh, in South Korea. Uh, if we have already prepared a permanent uh, institutional mechanism which would uh, uh, secure I mean, uh, peace uh, on the Korean Peninsula, uh, I think there will be some rooms for uh, reduction of the troop size. So there were some concerns about uh, what uh, President Trump uh, will do if he was uh, re-elected in the next four years. Uh, President Biden's uh, policy toward, uh, I mean, uh, the international society and uh, Korean Peninsula seems to be quite, uh, I mean, contrasting compared to President Trump's. Uh, he uh, regards alliance relationship uh, very important. He em emphasizes the importance of value, uh, I mean, such as democracy, freedom, uh, human rights, etc. Uh, in managing U.S. foreign policy uh, toward the world. Uh, so, in that regard, in terms of uh, alliance relationship. I think uh, South Koreans will be uh, relieved. And uh, also, I mean, he will not, I mean, uh, demand uh, uh, as, uh, as President Trump did, I mean, to increase, uh, I mean, defense budget, I mean, uh, I mean uh, and defense burden sharing, uh, for example, five times as President did. So, I mean, that's a kind of, uh, I mean, uh, positive and assuring uh, aspects of uh, President, I mean, Bi I mean, President Biden's, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, election. Uh, another important factor uh, I mean, the, between the United States and South Korea is denuclearization of North Korea. And uh, President Trump adopted a kind of top to bottom approach in the, rest, in, in the last two years, two or three years. Uh, he 
personally met uh, uh, Chairman uh, Kim Jong Un three times, and I think uh, I mean, that had uh, some positive impact in the sense that it improved a political atmosphere between North Korea and the United States, which would contribute. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, contribute to uh, I mean, uh, smoother or better uh, negotiation uh, process on denuclearization. Uh, however, uh, in the format, I mean, the, the, the fact that he met uh, uh, Pre uh, Chairman Kim Jong un three times uh, didn't uh, result in any uh, productive, I mean, uh, denuclearization uh, so far uh, in, the North in North Korea, mainly because uh, I mean, President uh, Trump and his negotiators uh, stuck to the traditional American approach uh, of demanding uh, North Korea uh, denuclearize uh, upfront. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, they have been arguing that North Korea should denuclearize first and then the United States uh, would reward. Um, but in my view, that kind of approach cannot work, mainly because very low uh, trust level between the United States and North Korea. So we need to be realistic in that regard. And it was, uh, I mean, a kind of welcoming remark when uh, uh, U.S. chief negoti negotiator uh, 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 Began, uh, Steve Began, uh, mentioned the possibility of pursuing denuclearization uh, through simultaneous and in parallel uh, approach. But I think that kind of uh, I mean, policy or strategic shift could not occur. And uh, I mean, because probably because of strong uh, opposition of hardliners. And anyway, that was the President Trump's approach on the issue of nuclear uh, problem. I think uh, President Biden uh, will adopt bottom up approach. And uh, he will be, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, he will de delegate uh, authority. Uh, to the negotiators, and uh, uh, only after negotiators uh, from both sides uh, agree on some important points of de uh, regarding denuclearization and what kind of return they would be, probably only after then uh, President Biden will meet uh, uh, Chairman Kim Jong Un. So. Uh, the uh, negotiation process uh, will be probably delayed uh, compared to the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the other case. I mean, the other case, uh, uh, I mean, that I mean, President Trump would uh, continue his presidency. Uh, but uh, advantage of having him as a uh, U.S. president is that he regards alliance relationship uh, very uh, I mean, important. Uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, I mean, how I think uh, South Korean I mean, people and some experts like myself view Biden's uh, election. And uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, bilateral relationship between the United States and South Korea, I'm sure uh, President Biden uh, will, uh, I mean, encourage or request a South Korean government to join uh, his uh, so-called uh, democratic. Uh, network, network of democracies. Uh, he is planning to deter uh, I mean, uh, some authoritarian uh, countries or dictatorial countries 
uh, by uh, aligning with uh, democratic countries as well as traditional allies. So uh, he will not uh, uh, try some kind of uh, American foreign policy uh, as uh, President uh, Trump uh, tried. I mean, go it alone uh, kind of policy. Instead, uh, President Biden will adopt uh, networking and coalition approach. So his uh, foreign policy will become probably more uh, systematic and uh, who knows, probably more uh, I mean, effective uh, in the future. I mean, all those things will be, uh, uh, will remain to be seen. Uh, so I'd like to stop there and uh, I will probably have opportunities to address other issues. Thank you very much. So, Yoon, this was a very substantive and interesting long statement. I think it will have uh, enough to discuss about uh, what you said about uh, the new approach by President-elect Biden is uh, with the feelings you described and the first impressions in many ways exactly what uh, the Germans and the Europeans are feeling. Um, the way you described uh, the South Korean situation was also very interesting. Thank you for all that, very reflective, you said. And I would now like give the floor to um, Professor Stark to comment from a German and European perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Baas, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yun uh, and uh, Professor Lee and their audience. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to participate in this inauguration uh, conference um, hosted by the Free University of Berlin and the KDI uh, School and I think the newly founded uh, Center on Korean and European Affairs uh, will really make a contribution uh, to stronger relations uh, in the scientific field, but maybe even in the political field between European countries, Germany and Korea. In the German framework, the Institute of Korean Studies is indispensable. And I'm sure that uh, the new center will complement the Institute's uh, far-reaching activities and high academic standards. So congratulations. But there is a second reason for congratulations, uh, and uh, Professor Yun uh, already mentioned it, South Korea's ma uh, management of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, of course, there are differences between uh, Germany, Europe, and South Korea and East Asia in this respect. Uh, and East Asia has more uh, experiences, but in um, general terms, I think uh, today we may learn more from South Korea than Germany or the member countries of the European Union um, um, or South Korea uh, may learn from uh, Germany or the member countries of the European Union. Uh, I think South Korea's handling of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, may really be a model uh, for the times coming and maybe for the next pandemic because COVID-19 will not be the last time. And there's a third uh, reason uh, for congratulations. And I think uh, this is the management um, of the dialogue process in the years 2018 and 2019 uh, between the United States, uh, North Korea and South Korea uh, by um, the South Korean uh, government, especially um, President Moon Jae-in uh, himself. Uh, I think um, all the time uh, South Korea uh, defined um, um, very realistic and constructive uh, policy. Um, it, uh, at the same time, it uh, cooperated with the United States uh, as a sometimes difficult partner, and namely President uh, Trump, uh, as a difficult partner um, in a very successful way. And as far as, far as possible, uh, 
South Korea uh, intensified relations with uh, China and there will be no progress and no solution uh, for uh, the Korean Peninsula without Chinese participation. So this has also been a very good example for good management. And my last point um, is that um, as well, South Korea uh, tried to engage North Korea as far as possible, um, that uh, it served as a bridge, as a diplomatic bridge between the United States and North Korea whenever it was possible. From my point of view, uh, all this is a, a demonstration, a very fine demonstration uh, of real statecraft uh, by uh, the South Korean administration and especially by uh, President uh, Moon Jae-in. And this happened in a very difficult uh, framework. Uh, and uh, I like to underline the point by Professor Yun. Um, that uh, uh, we are now in a difficult period of international relations, that the uh, present or the past uh, international order is questioned, that a new order uh, will emerge. It will not be a totally new order, but uh, um, there are, of course, uh, some power shifts and there is a special responsibility uh, for middle powers. And uh, let let me say this very um, uh, briefly. Uh, of course, the Republic of Korea is a middle power, but uh, even Germany is a middle power. Germany is a great middle power, um, and the European Union uh, is a union of middle powers. Some people perceive that we are a great power, but we are not a great power. We are a union of middle powers. Uh, and uh, uh, we have to formulate uh, our ambitions, uh, our uh, policy aims, and to work with like-minded countries like South Korea uh, and uh, others. Uh, we have heard something about the dialogue process in uh, 2018 uh, and 2019. Uh, and uh, I agree with uh, everything uh, Professor Yun uh, said before. Um, I think uh, it's very obvious that uh, uh, the Trump administration in general, and especially President Trump himself, favored something like a big deal, the solution of all problems at one time, uh, while North Korea wanted to start with lifting the sanctions and then a step-by-step -step, uh, approach um, in the field of nuclear armaments. Uh, the presidential elections in the United States on the 3rd of November opened the window for new and constructive negotiations. Uh, I am convinced that for President-elect Joe Biden and his administration, the conflict on the Korean Peninsula and especially uh, a solution for the nuclear question uh, will be back on the agenda. Uh, it will not be a priority in the first month, but I think it might be back at the agenda maybe mid 2021. Uh, so it is time to prepare. And as far as I know, South Korea started to prepare new initiatives uh, even uh, under the Trump administration. It's time to uh, start new initiatives that are better informed and more realistic um, on the side of the United States. Um, from my point of view, uh, a big deal is not feasible. What is needed uh, is to start a process, um, a process, of course, with the aim of freeing uh, the Korean Peninsula from uh, nuclear weapons, but a process characterized by step-by-step, -step, give and take, uh, and uh, um, accompanied by uh, political confidence building and confidence and security building uh, measures um, uh, also step by step. Uh, I agree that um, there is a lack of confidence 
uh, between the United States and North Korea. And it might be a sign of hope that uh, in 2018-2019, North Korea not only respected but implemented the agreements of conf on confidence and security building um, agreed uh, between North and South Korea. It stopped, stopped it only in the aftermath of the Hanoi uh, summit. So what about the European Union in general and uh, Germany? Unfortunately, and uh, um, I think at least at one time we have to look to um, the framework. Uh, unfortunately, today's European Union is not the strongest international player due to international uh, to internal divisions, internal divisions between North and South, um, East and West. We experienced that uh, in the last uh, days, unfortunately. Uh, the European Union is um, heavily affected by COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in the moment, uh, we are the uh, global center uh, of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, the European Union is confronted with uh, demanding security challenges on our own continent, just to mention the ongoing Ukraine crisis. Um, the relations with uh, Russia that uh, uh, are not satisfying uh, at all uh, and other uh, problems uh, in neighboring countries. And in general, there is a lack of consensus in a number of important questions. So unfortunately, the European Union uh, today is not so uh, well prepared um, to be a strong power in international affairs uh, as I'd like to see um, this union of state. But of course, there will be uh, UP, we will see European initiatives. Uh, and uh, of course, the European Union um, will adapt to the new situation um, created by presidential elections in the United States on November the 3rd. I think um, it is very obvious that 90% uh, of Germans, the uh, German government, 90% uh, of the members of the federal parliament and so on and so on, welcome the election uh, of uh, President uh, Biden. Uh, I think uh, it is um, a sign of normalization uh, because the erratic political style uh, of uh, President Trump will be, uh, uh, yes, an experience of the past um, on uh, 21st of January 2021. Uh, uh, but um, there are also some question marks um, because um, for some people, uh, Joe Biden is... Um, back to the past and not back to the future. Uh, and I think we have to um, realize that the United States uh, are deeply divided, that President uh, Biden um, is confronted uh, with a Republican majority uh, in the Senate. Uh, maybe the uh, by-elections in Georgia will change something, but I think it's not very uh, realistic. And, and I think this is the most important point uh, in four years, um, maybe not another Trump administration, but another Trump style administration uh, is possible. So two things are needed today. First, uh, to use uh, the momentum of the Biden administration, uh, because now it's possible uh, to do uh, something together in the field of international security, in the field uh, of climate change, and so on and so on. But on, uh, at the same time, I think it's, possible, it's necessary to think more about uh, European security uh, to uh, rely more on our own uh, resources uh, and to be less dependent uh, from the United States. We will have this debate uh, in uh, Germany and the European Union uh, for the next years. Unfortunately, 
uh, both the European Union and Germany uh, did not really support the dialogue process on the Korean Peninsula and between North Korea uh, and uh, the United States in 2018-2019. For some member countries, uh, sanctions, upholding the sanctions, uh, and rhetoric on human rights uh, seem to be more important than diplomacy and progress. And for other member states, uh, a new uh, conflict um, on the topic of a big deal with the Trump administration um, was not uh, really what they want to fight for. Um, but um, I think it's really a bad sign that in the Indo-Pacific guidelines issued by Germany in September 2020, the dialogue process on the Korean Peninsula is not even mentioned. And uh, German uh, support is not mentioned. The only topic that is mentioned regarding Korea is strength uh, strengthening uh, the sanctions. I think uh, this is not enough and standing by is not enough. Um, and if there is no consensus within the European Union, Germany and like-minded countries should take the proactive uh, initiative to support a new dialogue process on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it will start uh, with a step-by-step -step approach um, in the next uh, month. Uh, what can we do to support uh, such a process? Uh, I think there are various means uh, and instruments, but uh, they are limited. Uh, because we are not uh, at the center of the stage. We haven't been um, within the six party talks. Uh, we will not be um, part of uh, future talks between the two Korean states, China um, and uh, the United States, but we might offer uh, counsel and advice. It's possible for European countries and European uh, scientists and maybe uh, this um, new center and uh, the Institute, Korean Institute at Free University of Berlin uh, to organize um, track two and track 1.5 um, conferences to prepare um, and uh, support uh, official dialogues and uh, nego negotiations. I think the European experiences with that, with that kind of dialogues have been uh, promising, especially in the last years hosted by Sweden and Finland uh, and uh, other countries. Second, I think it's important that um, publicly uh, the European Union and Germany uh, should support such a new dialogue process. They should support the Republic of Korea and they should support the United States of America, the Biden administration, uh, if they prepare and if they start uh, such a new uh, dialogue process. Third, it is possible um, to uh, offer, if requested, always if requested, uh, certain German experiences on confidence and security building measures, uh, on verification, on arms control, uh, on arms reduction um, for uh, the start or uh, for the uh, procedures um, of a new process. And uh, I think it's also of um, utmost importance to be open uh, for uh, lifting the United Nations and the special European Union um, sanctions step by step in the process of give and take. Uh, personally, and uh, uh, from all my studies of the situation of, uh, on the Korean Peninsula uh, and other comparable cases, I do not see that there will be pros, progress without uh, um, conditional, conditioned and conditional uh, lifting of the sanctions, but in a step-by-step -step process, of course, not unconditional, um, and uh, it should happen uh, in a framework. So uh, summing up, um, Germany and the European Union should do more to support 
uh, a relaxation of tensions um, and cooperative security uh, on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asia uh, in general. Um, for the future, I do not see um, German and European uh, contributions uh, in terms of military presence in Northeast Asia. Uh, I think what uh, Germany and what the European Union uh, can really do uh, is to uh, engage by diplomatic and by uh, economic uh, means. And uh, I think sitting on the sidelines, just commenting uh, ongoing negotiations, um, as it happened in 2018 and 2019, uh, most of the time, uh, is uh, no constructive uh, option. So thank you very much. Uh, and I hope we will have a lively discussion. Thank you. Well, I couldn't agree more with a lot of things you mentioned. And um, I believe, if you allow me this comment, um, that the, let's call it, return of President-elect Biden to classical diplomacy, bottom-up, as you said, Minister Yoon, having diplomats preparing something big to happen and to be um, adopted by the leaders one day, but working more thoroughly, more in classical terms of diplomacy, which is in a way also a return to European values, so to say, or European experiences. Um, how Europe, the European Union, I mean, can slip in constructively is a very interesting and very important question if we feel we could do something. Many things have been mentioned and I believe that, that this place here in Berlin would be very uh, good to continue about uh, reflecting what we can do. Now one thing is now making headlines everywhere in the world and I would like to turn to the economic side of the world and this is RCEP. I've been myself, when I was ambassador in Indonesia and, uh, and uh, to ASEAN, uh, always um, witnessed the birth of this initiative, which actually was an ASEAN initiative, not a Chinese one. And the media are commenting on that already only from the Chinese point of view. But the fact is that, uh, like all cooperative frameworks, also this one, which is basically first a compilation of existing free trade agreements plus then something additional, they mean that uh, you're sitting together and China is not alone determining. So in this context, um, I think uh, the economies of the Southeast Asian, the Northeast Asian and the Australian world will indeed get a push to reflect on your initiatives uh, investment. So this is also a means of uh, entering the stage for the European Union, I believe, particularly since uh, the EU and ASEAN have always had a very good working relationship and I wouldn't call it a bond or a friendship, but uh, something quite substantive. Um, now, I know that the ASEAN processes with uh, China, with South Korea, India, Australia have been separate ones so far. And now they seem to be embedded in this larger framework of RCEP. Uh, maybe um, you could also comment on that. Uh, we are, as Germans, uh, actually still quite interesting for our economic performance. And uh, coming back to the big global issues, um, I think here Biden is also um, very promising, in particular his uh, climate change struggle plan, uh, $2 trillion. I mean, this is a huge sum. And uh, it sort of converges, in my view, with the um, EU Green Deal plan, if this can be realized. So here we have perhaps uh, on this side, common ground with Korea to act as partners in these big two multilateral deals, RCEP, economic integration and cooperation in Asia, and then the Green New Deal. Because the public is most interested in, in climate change struggle. 
Uh, they are impatient worldwide, and the question will become more and more urgent, what are the governments doing? And here Korea and Germany are really at the forefront of uh, middle powers, as you called them, uh, Minister Yoon, to um, take initiatives. Um, maybe Minister Yoon, you would also comment now on, uh, on Professor Stark's uh, introduction. I enjoyed uh, listening to Professor Stark's uh, uh, presentation very much, and I agreed with his view. Uh, I mean, uh, almost every uh, point. Uh, I also uh, appreciate his uh, uh, pointing out that uh, I mean uh, there were some divisions inside the European Union on how to deal with uh, North Korea. Uh, I mean, this is my personal view. So, uh, I mean, does not reflect any, I mean, uh, government's view or, I mean, some institutions view. I tend to think that uh, there uh, is some, uh, I mean, security dilemma uh, issue embedded in the nature of North Korea nuclear problem. What I'm saying is, uh, when the country A feels uh, I mean, insecure and tries to strengthen their defense by increasing their uh, budget uh, for defensive purpose, uh, its neighbor country B, I mean, I mean, can interpret that as a kind of offensive act rather than defensive act. So their is a kind of escalation process in this world of so-called anarchy. I mean, where nobody trusts uh, I mean, uh, each other. Uh, and for example, when uh, I mean, uh, North Korea was experiencing very dire uh, I mean, uh, situation in terms of economics and when it was uh, I mean, diplomatically isolated, when it witnessed, I mean, former uh, I mean, socialist uh, countries uh, are collapsing. I mean, 1990 or 1991. Uh, Kim Il-sung, North Korean leader, felt very insecure and wanted to normalize his relationship with the United States. Um, but the United States and South Korean government uh, declined uh, that uh, I mean, uh, offer. And uh, that shows, I mean, uh, I mean this sense of insecurity on the side of North Korea is working. Uh, I mean, has been working as one uh, reason uh, for uh, their uh, denuclearization. So we need to handle this problem. So uh, I, I think we need to sanction, I mean, North Korea on the one hand, but at the same time, we need to try harder to engage North Korea in a political dialogue so that we can mitigate uh, their insecurity complex. That will prepare a better uh, negotiation process. And that's the reason why I support the idea of declaring uh, I mean, the end of Korean War uh, formally, because that is one uh, process among many in terms of uh, providing security guarantee to North Korea. So I hope, uh, I, mean, uh, uh, I mean, this kind of aspect uh, uh, should not be, I mean, uh, I mean, disregarded by U.S. policymakers in coming years, and I'm also concerned about the possibility that uh, President Trump, I mean, President Biden, put aside North Korea for the time being because of uh, he is he would be surrounded by so many difficult domestic issues. And in that case, North Korea has a possibility to make provocation like a nuclear test or ICBM uh, I mean, uh, missile test or something like that. Then probably, I mean, what they could achieve in the last three years between the United States and North Korea will suddenly disappear and we would go back to a very 
dangerous and difficult situation, such as in 2017. So I think uh, we need, I mean, uh, uh, some support for this kind of political engagement from the European side too. So I appreciate uh, Professor Stark's observation on that, uh, on that issue. Uh, also, um, another point is, uh, I mean, uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Bas uh, mentioned about RCEP. I think this is a kind of positive development in the sense that when the global uh, trading system like uh, WTO is suffering and almost dead, it is desirable for us to have some kind of multilateral, I mean, uh, free trade agreement in the regional level, if not global level. So uh, I support RCEP and I also support uh, CPTPP. I mean, uh, that kind of, I mean, uh, regional cooperation, if uh, increases, I think that will help uh, to stabilize, I mean, international trade relations uh, to some extent. So let me stop there. Perhaps we can include these two issues in the list of possible um, initiatives or reflections. Uh, of course, um, it is um, obvious that the peace agreement between the two Koreas remains as a long-term goal. We understand that as Europeans. On the other hand, when we were confronted with German unification, there was no peace agreement towards the end because all the two plus four agreements we had actually already presented a peace ad agreement. So I think it needs a very sophisticated, historically based and politically sensitive process to approach that issue of a peace treaty. But as you said, Minister Yoon, it is obvious that you can't just have an upfront claim, denuclearize, and then we'll give you peace, uh, security guarantees, uh, but to combine the things so that both parties take confidence in negotiating to such a goal and feel reassured, both sides, both sides. Also, of course, North Korea needs these assurances to give to the South and to the world. Anyway, um, I believe that still, as Professor Stark mentioned, the European Union, if only a little bit more united, <laughs> could play a positive role. Let's hope that we will overcome this current um, disarray uh, and opinions on the future of the big recovery plan. And uh, let's also not forget that actually it is the European member states who have embassies in Pyongyang. I think it's a potential which has not yet been used I remember when I was ambassador in uh, Seoul, I very often invited my colleague from Pyongyang. And then when we met with the foreign ministry and also the Americans uh, and the Japanese who were very interested to learn, they took notes about uh, everything our ambassador in Pyongyang said. Even these were things in the atmospheric uh, situation of the North. But we have some means of interaction and we should uh, perhaps try to bring that into a broader concept. But uh, back to um, Professor Stark, uh, the uh, European U Union sort of disaccord should also not be a sort of a hindrance or should not prevent us from doing something. Uh, particularly if there are crises, if there are new situations, there's also a new chance. And it seems to me what uh, Minister Yoon said at the beginning, we are actually entering a phase of a vacuum. The, 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 the big powers, the world powers sort of have sort of lost trace of their role of determining, but they're stuck in their situations, sometimes also in their challenges and problems. And uh, relations with China from the European side are of course key to the future Asia policy, but they are not, not an end in itself. And they, I think, will also have more challenges faced by the human rights situation in China. And things have gotten a bit more difficult than a couple of years ago they looked. Also here, Professor Yoon, I see a role for uh, what you called the, um, who you said, the middle powers or the, the powers in between 
to make their voice more heard and to unite in joint statements and joint initiatives. Um, uh, do you think that actually, Professor Yoon, Minister Yoon, that the South Korean government is a strong government now? Uh, uh, the ruling party, I mean, has taken the majority of the National Assembly, and I think it will help, and it has been helping probably, uh, President Moon Jae-in's uh, implementation of his foreign policy. Uh, most, I mean, many people, I mean, most people in Korea wants uh, no confrontation with North Korea. I mean, the, they experienced uh, I mean, a crisis situation in 2017, for example, and they recognize how it was, how much uh, dangerous uh, the situation was. Uh, so they, I mean, uh, want some kind of normal normalization of inter-Korean relationship in one way or another. Or another. And they want, I mean, uh, our government wants uh, to promote inter-Korean cooperation. But of course, we have uh, international economic sanction. And uh, South Korean government uh, had better respect and it has been respecting uh, international sanctions. It cannot defect from international coalition of sanctioning North Korea. So it uh, faced uh, some kind of dilemma. And uh, I have been personally arguing for focusing on uh, uh, medical and public health cooperation with North Korea or environmental cooperation with North Korea because those uh, fears are outside of uh, economic sanction. The problem is uh, North Koreans, I mean, they uh, I mean, tended to avoid, uh, I mean, to cooperate on those uh, I mean, uh, issues. So uh, I personally hope that uh, I mean, the uh, South Korean government uh, aims to uh, uh, cooperate with North Korea in those issue areas through a kind of multilateral mechanism because uh, North Koreans tended to join the multilateral cooperative mechanism uh, in one way or another. So, uh, I mean, we South Korea may have some indirect uh, route of mutual cooperation through multilateral mechanism. Uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, that's better than uh, doing nothing. Uh, so uh, in that regard, I think uh, uh, I mean, uh, our government has better try to uh, I mean, uh, try to mobilize its uh, political capital, trying to persuade uh, I mean, Chairman, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un, and also at the same time, uh, President Biden. Uh, pre, uh, I, mean, in, uh, in, I mean, toward uh, US uh, administration, I think our government had better uh, I mean, uh, persuade them uh, about the urgency of dealing with North Korea nuclear issue. issue. And on, on the other hand, we need to persuade uh, I mean, Chairman uh, Kim Jong-un not, uh, not to provoke and uh, I mean, ask them to uh, be patient. So we have uh, lots of difficult diplomatic agendas. And uh, I, uh, I mean, having, I mean, uh, I mean majority seat uh, for the ruling party in the National Assembly would be I mean, uh, uh, helpful uh, for our president to pursue that kind of uh, active uh, diplomacy, I guess. Actually, there was one question from Dr. So Yong Cho, and uh, I will read it. I almost think you have answered it. I'm reading it now. The inter-Korea relationship has been frequently changed depending on who is in the presidential office in South Korea. Such discontinuity frustrates efforts for trust building with the North. 
South Korea will have a new presidential election in two years. My question to Professor Yoon is, what would be your advice for the South Korean government regarding how the continuity of inter-Korea policy can be ensured? Let me answer this way. I mean, let me take the German example. Uh, I mean, the, uh, Chancellor uh, Billy Brandt uh, began uh, Ostpolitik uh, in the early 1970s. And that Ostpolitik, I mean, uh, engagement policy toward uh, East Germany and uh, Eastern European countries was adopted by uh, Chancellor Helmut Kohl after he got power in 1982. In that way, there was continuity of engagement policy toward East Asia, I mean, East Germany. And I think uh, that uh, kind of continuity deepened uh, inter-German relationship, person-to-person -person relationship. And it could provide some kind of important uh, background, social and political background for unification. Unfortunately, I mean, that was not the case in our country. Uh, there were certain, I mean, shift of North Korea policy uh, in 2007 uh, after uh, President Noh Moo-hyun's term ended. And uh, there was no consistency uh, in terms of how to deal with uh, North Korea, how to interact with North Korea. In that way, we could not uh, accumulate a kind of person-to-person -person, uh, relationship uh, between North Koreans and South Koreans. We could not uh, establish a strongly working institutional mechanism between two Koreas. So uh, my advice to the next president whether he would be a con conservative leader or a progressive leader, I would strongly advise him, uh, please continue to engage North Korea in dialogue mm -hmm. while continuing to, uh, uh, continuing to try persuade uh, North Korean leader uh, that denuclearization is the uh, is the best option for his own country uh, and for South Korea as well as international society. Of course, I mean, uh, uh, security guarantee as well as economic assistance uh, should be uh, I mean, provided to North Korea uh, when uh, North Korea dis make a strategic decision to, 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 uh, to denuclearize. Uh, so we have a lot of things to do, a lot of homework uh, to do in the future, even for the next president in, in, in South Korea. Thank you. Dr. So Young Cho also asked Professor Stark, I'd like to ask you about the German experience that can be relevant for South Korea in this regard. For instance, how the Eastern policy has been adopted by the opposition and the following conservative government in Germany. Uh, yes, thank you. I think the question has been answered uh, by Professor Yoon. Uh, I think it, uh, uh, this is one of the uh, differences between German and Korean uh, experiences that uh, in Germany there was this kind of continuity. Uh, I hope, and it might depend uh, on what the Biden administration is uh, doing now, uh, that some sort of continuity uh, might be possible in um, uh, Korea as well. But I think there is another big difference uh, between Korea and Germany, um, uh, even in times of crisis and real uh, tensions, even military tensions between the superpowers, um, East Germany and West Germany uh, agree uh, to um, uphold their close relations and develop their close relations. And in the Korean case, um, uh, until now, 
uh, North Korea is most of the time um, looking towards the United States and not uh, um, towards preserving and developing uh, the very small ties between North and South. Uh, and I think it would be um, really uh, a good development and maybe uh, Germans and Europeans may have a function uh, in doing this to persuade North Korea that relations between uh, North Korea and South Korea are not only uh, a function of uh, North Korean relations with the United States, um, but a certain value uh, in itself. And I think this is really a complicated problem uh, that uh, uh, makes it difficult to transfer German experiences uh, to uh, Korea. Thank you. Another question from Dr. Balbach. The presenters have called for a stronger engagement of Germany and the EU regarding the security situation on the Korean Peninsula. Nevertheless, offers from Germany, for instance, to establish a trilateral dialogue format have been repeatedly rejected by North Korea, but sometimes also by South Korea. Part of the reason for this lies in South Korea's challenging geopolitical situation, which makes it difficult to respond to such offers, not least because major regional powers are watching every closely to see who South Korea is approaching in terms of security policy. For this reason too, South Korea has reacted very cautiously to the German Indo-Pacific strategy. How can South Korea meet this ge geopolitical challenge? That's an, uh, that's an important issue actually also, at the same time, politically, it can be a, a politically sensitive issue too. Um, let me explain this way. I mean, this is my personal view. Um, uh, most South Koreans want uh, I mean, uh, alliance between the United States and South Korea uh, targeting North Korea only. I mean, uh, uh, they feel uh, I mean, uncomfortable uh, I mean, regarding including China as a target of U.S. ROK alliance. I think that's natural because if we look back the history of Korean Peninsula, whenever there was some uh, military confrontation between uh, maritime power and uh, continental power, Koreans suffered a lot. For example, in 1592, uh, Japan invaded Korean Peninsula, uh, demanding the Korean government uh, to uh, clear the way for them to invade Ming Dynasty in China. And we suffered greatly, I mean, uh, seven, eight years of uh, very, I mean, uh, uh, miserable uh, war. In the late 19th century, we experienced uh, Sino-Japanese war, uh, Russo-Japanese war, uh, regarding which country will occupy South Korea. Uh, finally, I mean, South Korea, I mean, became the colony of Japan. And they suffered, Koreans suffered for 36 years. And even after the independence, because of the confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States, our country has been divided. And five years later, there was a war. Uh, the Soviet Union and China supported uh, North Korean uh, I mean, invasion. Uh, and that was, uh, I mean, this kind of continuation of tragedy was there. So uh, my recommendation for the Korean uh, policy uh, on the issue of uh, US-China relations is like this. I mean, South Korea is a democratic country. And uh, I mean, uh, South Korea is built up, uh, on the identity of important values such as democracy, freedom, etc., etc. 
So in terms of uh, I mean, promoting those values, I think uh, South Korea uh, will join the United States uh, actively. Uh, and in terms of economic uh, diplomacy, South Korea will uh, join uh, the U.S. when uh, it tries to, I mean, uh, uh, fix international economic order toward the right direction, respecting fair rules, for example, in economic transactions. However, in terms of military confrontation, I hope uh, our ally, the United States, would understand Korean Peninsula's I mean, unique geopolitical dilemma and try to avoid uh, pushing uh, South Korea uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, to the situation, to the difficult situation uh, to pick between the United States and China in terms of military confrontation. So I think uh, in that way, I think uh, we hope uh, Indochina uh, I mean, uh, concept, uh, I mean, if that helps, I mean, uh, I mean, and contributes to the promotion of democracy or fair rule of game, uh, I mean, fair rule of economic, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, interactions, etc. I think there are uh, rooms for Korea's uh, participation. And actually, South Korean government has already expressed their willingness uh, to, to link our government's uh, new southern policy uh, to uh, Indo-Pacific uh, some time ago. Uh, so there are, I mean, uh, many uh, rooms where we can cooperate with uh, our ally, the United States. But on the military confrontational issues, I think South Korea needs to be very prudent and uh, I mean, uh, rational. That's my way of answering to that question. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, uh, whether that makes sense. Uh, well done, thank you so much. Uh, there's another interesting question. Um, thank you for sharing exciting statements. I am Mongshul Bad Erdine from Mongolia and student at Korean Studies of Free, Free University. Professor Yoon and Mr. Baas mentioned about the attendance and role of a middle power and great power such as the US and EU. I would like to ask about small countries' role, such as Mongolia. Last few years, the Mongolian government arranged Ulaanbaatar program, which is a dialogue for Northeast Asian security and trying to make open dialogue platform with Northeast Asian countries. We are often talking about great power or middle power. I want to interest what about small power and influence of small power is essential. What kind of specific role can Mongolia play in the international regime building in Northeast Asia? You want to take the floor, Minister Yun? South Korea was a small country. I mean, uh, so uh, we understand the agony of small countries very well. And that's exactly why our government has been trying to provide some uh, uh, assistance or help uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, our experience of economic development or in some other aspects. So we respect I mean, our uh, neighboring countries, uh, I mean, small uh, neighboring countries, and we want to uh, go together in terms of, I mean, promoting, uh, I mean, transparency and rule-based order, multilateral, uh, multilateralism, uh, I mean, that kind of thing. So uh, I think uh, there are uh, room for small countries to contribute in those issue areas. For example, uh, Northern European countries, I mean, Finland and Norway and Sweden, in terms of economic size, I think uh, in terms of economic size and population size, uh, I mean, uh, I think I can categorize those countries as a small country. Uh, even though, I mean, they are rich country, I mean, uh, but 
they have been doing excellent and important roles of uh, assisting other uh, countries. Uh, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, I mean, uh, uh, developmental assistance and uh, human rights concern, and uh, some other uh, in some other fields. Uh, also, Singapore, even though I mean it's a rich uh, state, it's a small country, and it has been providing some kind of intellectual leadership to the uh, ASEAN countries. So I think there are, uh, I mean, uh, rooms for small countries uh, to contribute, uh, to, to promote, I mean, values and uh, common goals such as peace and prosperity in the world. I think that is a very important point and a good statement. I can only share it from our experience in the European Union. Smaller countries, uh, you mentioned Finland and others, but even, even smaller ones like Luxembourg also almost played a decisive role because uh, they uh, were exactly, as you said, uh, good concept conceptual thinkers. They could easily take initiatives which the bigger states were not able to take because uh, they would have been eyed immediately for their own national interests. So the smaller ones are freer to move in this sphere. So I very much agree with what you said, and it's a basic European experience. Now there is a, a question by Dr. Sang Kuo Kim. Uh, to me, he said, she said uh, that in the development of peace on the Korean Peninsula and relations with North Korea, South Korea's domestic policy towards the North Korea plays a very important role. In particular, it is evaluated that the US and EU policies towards North Korea were influenced by the conservative government of Korea in the past. I would like to know your thoughts on the impact of South Korean policy towards North Korea on Europe. After the Korean Sunshine Policy, I think it took a lot of time for the 27 countries in the EU to revise and arrange their North Korean policies as desired by the Conservative government. So in order for Europe to contribute to peace on the Korean Peninsula, is there any way to stabilize the Koreans of the Republic of Korea government's policy towards North Korea? Well, that is a tricky question and one perhaps um, on which I should comment first of all that we regarded our uh, policy towards the Korean Peninsula both as Germans and I can say, I believe, as Europeans um, as always uh, reflecting European values, traditions and experiences. But of course, I mean, uh, countries like the UK, uh, France and um, uh, you know, they are members of the Security Council of the United Nations and they take a view at the Korean Peninsula uh, as far as the nuclear issues are concerned from a perhaps more engaged perspective than the Germans, which don't have a say there, which have no nuclear deterrent. At the same time, uh, our stance was always uh, on North Korea, when it was about North Korea, was always uh, made a little bit more complicated by the view of French. The French said, uh, this is a country with whom we don't want to have dialogue. They continuously violate human rights. We will not have an embassy there. We don't want to go there. We don't want to do anything. So the, to find a balance in between these various views is not an easy challenge. And uh, I think in a way it's even, it's even a, a miracle <laughs> that at least we, we went so far as uh, taking advantage of other multilateral experiences, processes, and have also um, presence in North Korea. At the same time, I would also like to underline the role of parliamentarians. And I was wondering what you think about that, Minister Yoon, because it has been argued recently more and more often that in North Korea, the role of the party has been strengthened over the last years uh, with a perhaps slightly declining role of the military and political decision making, apart from the fact we know at the end, it's the leader who says where, where to go. But if the party plays a slightly more important role, perhaps as opinion maker or getting into the whole politics, would it be worth enhancing that um, um, exchange of parliamentarians? Um, actually, I have an experience of talking to uh, very high level, I mean, uh, 
a political leader in the National Assembly recently, and he was very much interested in promoting that kind of uh, inter-Korean parliamentary and uh, parliamentary cooperation. And uh, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, if we can uh, have that kind of interaction between uh, par uh, parliament members uh, between the North and South, of course, that will be very, very helpful and constructive uh, from a medium and long-term perspective as well. But I think still uh, the problem is uh, whether uh, the top leader of North Korea would want to have that kind of interaction or not. Uh, so, so far I could not find any indication, any positive indication from the uh, Northern side on that, unfortunately. Uh, I just also have to mention this respect that we have one parliamentarian, Hartmut Koschek, who has been very active in uh, promoting relationship with his contacts uh, to the North uh, Euro uh, Korean People's Assembly. But I, I take what you see as um, um, not perhaps an advice, but a kind of um, opinion on how to continue. And the, the view arising from this is it's not worthless. We should continue with parliamentary contacts. They don't do damage, but they might contribute a bit more one day. Is that correct? Now there is a question by Ulsop Shin to both professors. How do you see the future of Korean-US relationship, which is regarded as a base for Korean peace building process? And after the US president election, we have news about the future of the transatlantic relationship. Uh, many experts anticipate a more rule-based international order and value of human rights. And we see the fact many of European states mentioned about actually human rights problems and democracy problems regarding China. But even though Korea emphasizes the importance of the US-Korean mutual cooperation, frankly speaking, the Republic of Korea hesitates to participate or to show efforts to the US because of our relationship with China. For example, joining the Indo-Pacific concept, critic of some kind of Chinese undemocracy. If this kind of Korean political positioning and acting is proceeding, the future relationship between the US and Korea isn't sure to say well. The first question is very easy yeah. to answer uh, because uh, um, uh, alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States uh, will be essential uh, also for the foreseeable future. Uh, it is a, a matter of fact, uh, and in the present situation, it is uh, indispensable. And uh, I think from a, a South Korean perspective, uh, it's uh, easier um, to handle this alliance than uh, it was in the last uh, four years. Uh, the question of uh, transatlantic uh, relations and relations with uh, China is much more complicated. Uh, I think um, uh, it, uh, first uh, we have to uh, acknowledge that uh, China has changed in the last years. Uh, China is uh, today uh, much more autocratic uh, it's uh, a very bad step uh, that uh, uh, the principle of uh, two systems, one country in uh, Hong Kong uh, is partly uh, suspended. Uh, what happened in uh, Xinjiang is not uh, acceptable and so on and so on. Um, but uh, I think it's, uh, and it has to be addressed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, our means to influence it uh, from the outside are uh, limited. Uh, and the result is that the European Union defined uh, China as a partner, as a competitor, and as a systemic rival. And I think this is right. Um, the um, United States approach uh, is a little bit uh, different. For Trump, uh, China was a, um, not only a rival, uh, but a foe. Uh, I think uh, Biden is a little bit, the uh, Biden approach will be a little bit uh, more complex, but, but we do not know uh, in the moment. 
Uh, I think, um, basically, I think the rise of China is a matter of fact. And we have to deal with the rise of China, and it is not possible. Uh, this is a historical development, and I think it's uh, good for the population of China because it means more welfare. Uh, and uh, I think basically, I think it's not possible uh, to stop it. On the other hand, we need um, uh, better ways uh, to deal with this rise of China. Uh, and I think it should be a combination of confronting China in terms of human rights and, uh, of course, in other terms, uh, economy and security, um, but not in the sense of a military confrontation. And what I'd like to see is not a transatlantic alliance against China, but a European point of view and a United States point of view uh, and a certain uh, common ground. Uh, and I think in this sense, um, the Regional Economic Partnership Agreement uh, is very significant because it signals from the region that uh, most of the countries in the region wanted both or want both uh, economic cooperation uh, with China uh, on a, so within a certain framework. And on the other hand, a certain balancing uh, towards China, um, and this includes security guarantees by uh, the United States. But uh, in some, I think um, a confrontational approach will not change the situation. A confrontational approach uh, will uh, complicate the situation. So we need uh, the right balance of this uh, mixture, cooperation, systemic rivalry, uh, and uh, competition between uh, China uh, and Western countries. Couldn't agree more on what you said about RCEP in your last sentences. As I mentioned, I've witnessed the beginning of that process. And uh, until now, it has um, still the stamp of an ASEAN initiative, and it redefines ASEAN centrality. That means that actually uh, you can say that ASEAN is a kind of chief organizer of the whole thing. The question of the weight within this group is a different, different one. Of course, China will be hugely important, but there are possibilities to react against Chinese wishes. And that makes it important, as you said. I think perhaps that would really be a kind of a future bridge of also for Korean German initiatives. I don't know, that has to be found out and figured out, but it's an interesting development. Uh, I agree very much. Professor Yun, you want to comment also on that question? Uh, I, there was a question about the future of US-Korea relations uh, in the uh, I mean, uh, let me address uh, that issue. I think uh, it's time for the US and ROK uh, to, uh, to, to begin uh, in-depth, I mean, discussion about the future of uh, alliance. Uh, as we know, I mean, the uh, bilateral alliance between two countries was uh, established seven decades ago. I mean, there has been lots of change in terms of international situation. Uh, so we need to reset or update our alliance so that it can fit a better to the current uh, situation. For example, we need to establish a kind of common vision about the uh, future of the Korean Peninsula. What kind of Korean Peninsula both countries uh, want to have. Uh, and it, but I, I think uh, there may be some divergence between two countries as of now. So uh, trying to narrow those, uh, that gap and uh, have a common uh, vision for the uh, long-term goal of the Korean Peninsula, I think that's, that's an important uh, thing for us to do. And also, urgent because, uh, I mean, without having common vision, 
discussing some uh, I mean, detailed issues like uh, denuclearization or uh, I mean the, yeah, or uh, uh, some of the uh, bilateral issues, uh, defense burden sharing issues or something like that. It's like uh, uh, cart uh, pulling I mean, the horse rather than the vice versa. So uh, we need to agree on general uh, concept about the alliance. Uh, and one of the key issues that uh, both countries this should uh, discuss is how we can, I mean, uh, both the United States and ROK uh, can provide a security guarantee to North Korea without which denuclearization process will be impossible in my personal view. I think uh, in security guarantee and economic assistance should be provided to North Korea in return for their denuclearization, their strategic decision to give up uh, I mean, whole nuclear program. The problem is how to pro what kind of a security guarantee we can provide to North Korea without weakening uh, alliance. I mean, especially this issue is related uh, the U.S. troops stationing in South Korea. Uh, North Korea may want to, I mean, uh, I mean want to uh, want uh, I mean, U.S. troop withdrawal uh, publicly, but uh, in some uh, other cases, I mean, their leaders uh, told the South Korean uh, political leaders that they would, uh, it would be okay for them. Uh, to have uh, continued uh, U.S. troops stationing in South Korea. So, I mean, that kind of tricky, but very important issues should be dealt with in, in, uh, in bilateral uh, in, uh, uh, negotiation or uh, talks between two uh, countries. Again, a very important point. I'm now urged to uh, come to an end. So I would like uh, to thank you both very, very much for this, uh, in my view, substantive discussion with a lot of uh, interesting arguments. Uh, some thinking of that will certainly flow into our reflections and we can try to continue to work on that. Thank you very much, Minister Yoon from Korea and thank you very much, Professor Stark from Hamburg. Uh, it was very good to have you here and it was a pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Very thank nice you. to see you again. As I say, you're...